I want to talk to you about your, your new book, We Who Wrestle With God. Yep. A lot of your fans, there's all yep. sorts of Jordan Peterson groups that you can join who debate whether you really believe in God or not. So let's just get it on the table. Do you believe in God? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think that's any of, I don't think that's anybody's business. I think it's the most private question you can ask someone, but then I would say also, uh, what's the right response to that? By their fruits, you will know them. How's that? Well, that's let me ask right you a different, let me ask you a different question. question then. Do you, do you think there is a God? Oh, I'm terrified that there might be, Pierce. How's that? And, I, you know, I'm not trying to be a smartass when I'm making that comment either. Like they say, it's an, old, it's an Old Testament saying, I believe, that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And that's actually, that is actually about as true a statement as you could manage in such a short phrase. And, you know, people have congratulated me. I was at the Buckley Institute last night. They were congratulating me on my courage. And I think, and I said this last night, it's like, you guys don't understand. It has nothing to do with courage. I'm just afraid of different things than the people who lie. And I'm afraid, for example, of what happens when you lose control of your tongue. And I said that back in 2016 when I first opposed the Canadian government. And people were, you know, congratulating me. It's like, well, you're so brave to stand up to the government. It's like, I'm nowhere near as afraid of the government as I am of what happens when people lose control of their tongue. I studied totalitarianism for well, since I was 13 years old, in depth. And I know what happens when people lose control of their tongue. Mm. What happens is everything goes to hell. And I don't mean, I mean that metaphysically. I mean, might even mean it theologically, but you can just say, don't even bother with that. But what's fascinating- Let's just okay. mean it practically. But what's interesting is, I completely agree with you, by the way. Um, and you are the most open book of almost anyone I've ever interviewed, right to the point I asked you if you believe in God. I didn't actually know what you were going to say, but for some reason you're reluctant to say. Why are you reluctant? Well, okay, let's let let's walk along that. Well, because it's a it's not a it's not a well posed question. It's too complicated an issue to be dealt with like that. You step into instant traps just by accepting the question. So, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So, the first thing I would say is, what do you mean by believe? Like, do you think that a statement about the existence of God is something like a scientific theory? Do you think it's a list of facts? Is it a factual question? Does God exist or not? Is it a factual question like you're asking about whether a cup on a table exists or a plate on a table, an artifact in a room? What do you mean by this? What do you mean by believe? I'll stake my life on the proposition that God exists. How's that? Well, is that an answer? Because well, that's the right answer. I would ask you, here's my supplementary. Do you ever pray? Always. Who do you pray to? The spirit that protects you from hell. But that, many people would say, is God. Hey, sounds good to me. And so you might say, well, I said I pray always. So what does that mean? I'm trying to say the most, the clearest words I can say. And I do that by paying attention. I'm listening to the words and feeling them as I move along, thinking, is that a firm foundation in the morass? Is that a, is that a bridge over the abyss? Is that word the right word? I do that when I'm writing. I do that when I'm talking. And I do that because I don't want to be in the abyss. And the pathway over the abyss is the truth. Now, with regards to belief in God, you might say, and I know, I know that, that you're not particularly religiously inclined, at least that's the theory. It's like, well, you have a character, Pierce. Everyone has a character. You could say that would be the spirit of Pierce Morgan. And then we might say, well, let's inquire into that spirit. If you were a hedonist, then the spirit that would be Pierce Morgan would be your hedonistic whims. And that would be your God. I would say if you're a noble person, then your spirit is something elevated above your mere whims. And then there's the spirit that's inculcated within you. It's a consequence, perhaps, of your socialization. But in a more sophisticated way, it's actually a consequence of the spirit that you've allowed as a consequence of your choices to dwell within you. 
And that spirit has a nature. It might be allied with the truth. It might be allied with falsehood. If it's allied with the truth, it's a manifestation of what has been considered traditionally the logos. The more you're aligned with the truth, the more your spirit is an avatar of the logos. And that's just, it's true. It's religiously true, as it turns out, but it's also technically true. It's technically true. See, I had a debate... And so I'm, going to, I'm making that case in the new book. Right, so I had a debate with Richard Dawkins about this, uh, who was a bit disingenuous for me, because he sat with me for a whole show, seemed to enjoy it, thanked me very much for it, and then called me a fool afterwards in some podcast. So I, I know you've had a few mm. run-ins with him, and, it, and I, it doesn't surprise me. But uh, what I said to Dawkins was, because I was raised a Catholic, I was given spiritual guidance for several years by Catholic nuns, uh, and I do believe in God. And the reason I said to him is that no human brain can really explain to me, or anybody, what was there before, before nothing. So if you believe in a Big Bang Theory, well, what, what was there before that? Because I don't think any human brain has that power to, un, to explain or answer that question, to me it makes perfect sense there should be some being, entity, something, which is superior to a human brain. And I'm, I would think that someone with your brain would think that too. Because there are questions we simply well, that's, can't answer. Okay. Okay. Three things about that. So the first is that's the argument by design that things are so complex and sophisticated that that cries out for the hypothesis of something like a creator. I'm not a big fan of the argument by design. I can see its advantages, but it isn't the primary argument as far as I'm concerned. So the the Big Bang proponents have a problem because it's a tenet of the Big Bang Theory that the laws of physics themselves break down at the point of the singularity, and that would be the point just before the Big Bang. And when you say the laws of physics, the existence of space and time even, is an unknowable prior to the Big Bang, you're basically positing a miracle at the beginning of existence. And so if you get to have your miracle, there's no reason the religious types can't have theirs. You might argue about what the miracle needs to be, and I think that's an argument that has to be had. I don't like the argument by design. I like the argument by conscience better. Mm. So the argument by conscience, which is another string of classic theological thought, is that something dwells within you that aligns you with the spirit of reality. And it's the still small voice within that was identified first by the prophet Elijah. And it was part of a transformation in the religious viewpoint in historical terms that moved the notion of God from something like Baal, B-A-L, B-A-B-A-A-L, a nature God, the God of storms and earthquakes, of, of, of what would you say, remarkable and awe-inspiring natural phenomena, to the voice within that can, if you attend to it, align you with the structure of reality itself, that internal voice being a manifestation of God. And I think that's an extremely powerful argument, and I think it's right. And what I'll you... tell you something about Dawkins' work that's very interesting. Mm. So Dawkins has pointed out that an organism has to be a microcosm of its environment in order to survive. And I would say the, con the voice of conscience within us is the most unerring manifestation of the microcosm within. And I think you can make an extraordinarily powerful biological case for that. And I've done that in this new book. So I think Dawkins' argument... I think Dawkins' argument invalidates his, his epistemology. Yeah, I agree. I really believe that. But what do you think? I mean, you, you've had moments in your life in recent years where I would imagine you have faced the prospect of potentially dying. And in those moments, yeah. in those moments, what have you felt and what do you think happens to you? If you do die or you had died, what, what did you imagine might happen to you? Well, at the... I had lots of moments, moments, years in the last few years where dying would have been an absolute relief. And had that been accompanied by the complete cessation of my being, I would have been perfectly content with that. There are things that are far worse than dying. So if you're only terrified of dying, you've hardly begun to plumb the depths of existential catastrophe. <laughs> well, de death, death is fairly... You just don't have an imagination. What could be worse than dying? Being a prison guard at Auschwitz? But you'd still be alive, even if you were witnessing horror. It's not death that the oh, ultimate... Oh, no. I'm thinking perpetrating it. Right. You mean... Carrying... How, about a, how about being an Auschwitz guard at a, How about being an Auschwitz guard who really enjoyed his job? Hmm.
How about that? That's worse than death, as far as I'm concerned. Right. I mean that. No, no, I, I see that. That's hell, man. Yeah, it's a living hell. That's hell. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. But do you think there so, is? But do you so, think there's an actual hell, Jordan? Is there? Is there somewhere that people like that go to, which is hell? Oh, definitely. Now, what what relationship that has to what happens to you when you die? I have no idea. I mean, I don't think anybody's in a position to speak about what's truly beyond our ken, let's say. I don't think we understand consciousness at all. We don't understand time. We don't understand the relationship between finitude and, in, and, and, and the infinite landscape that surrounds us. That's all a great mystery, and I tend to leave that alone because I try not to speak about things that I can't speak about. But does hell exist? It's like, study history and see if you can figure it out for yourself. I mean, does, does heaven there's exist? Nothing, there's nothing that's more obvious than that hell exists. So does, I mean, does heaven exist? Mao's China was hell. Right, but does, so you're talking about hell on earth, but do you believe there's a hell after death? Uh, like I said, I, I, I can't, I can't, I don't speculate about such things. I don't, that's where my ignorance finds its, mm. what would you say? That's where my knowledge finds its limit. I'm, I'm concerned enough about what I'm doing right now, right here, and, and leaving the rest of that. And, you know, I'm, so I have to leave it at that. The hell that I see as a potential on earth is sufficient as a deterrent, and it's of, of sufficient reality. You know, you can ask, well, is it eternal? Well, I would say, well, look, all totalitarian states are variants on a theme, let's say, and that theme persists. All archetypal stories are eternal. Everything that happened in the Bible happened and is happening and will continue to happen forever. Mm. It's part of the eternal human story. It's hyper real. And, and heaven and hell are part of that. Mm. What that means in the final analysis, I don't know. I mean, you asked, I think you asked in there, you know, there, hell is real, is heaven real? It's like, mm. well, heaven is as far away from hell as you can get. Mm. That's a good way of thinking about right. it. Um, I've spent my whole life trying to determine how you get as far away from being a camp guard at Auschwitz who enjoys his job as possible. And one of the things, one of the things I've realized in recent years, for example, is that you are far from that if you're engaging in your interactions with the world in the spirit of voluntary play. You know, and we're playing during this conversation, and Joe Rogan plays on his podcast all the time. And if you're in a playful state with your wife, your marriage is optimized. And the state of play is the opposite of tyranny. And that's why it says in the Gospels that if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to become like a little child. So you want to reinstate that, that open-eyed, wide-eyed acceptance of life that is the precursor to voluntary play. You want to develop your character to the point where that's part and parcel of your life on an ongoing basis. And that's allowing that spirit of the Logos to inhabit you. That's another way of thinking about it. And you can, you can certainly aid that with prayer. You know, people don't understand. People think of God as the joke is a cosmic butler. You pray to have your wishes granted. It's like, he's not a genie. You want to pr pray? It's like, pray about your stupidity. Here's a prayer that'll work for sure. You want to see if prayer works? Here's one. This will work. Sit on the edge of your bed. Ask yourself, what bloody stupid thing do I continue to do that's making my life more miserable than it has to be and everyone else's life around me that I could give up, that I would give up? And, but you have to really want the answer. So you open yourself up in humility to a revelation. Mm. You'll get an answer. It won't be one you want. That's how you'll know it's true. <laughs> but if you act on it, then your life will improve. And that's a proper prayer. Yeah. That's, that's what you do. Like in a metaphysical sense, the Christian insistence that you should be aware of your sins, you know, which is in, sense, in a sense an existential burden, is also the idea that you should attend to your own inadequacies and admit to them because in doing so, you open up the possibility that something better can make itself manifest within you. And there's no doubt that that's the case. That's for sure, that's true. But you have to do it in humility. 
And you have to be looking. That's why you're supposed to take the moat out of your own eye instead of worrying about the beam in your neighbor's eye. It's like <laughs> there's something about you that's stupid you could fix. Yeah. And God will tell you what it is if you want him to, <laughs> so to speak.